chickens, and cows. Where do they come from? Behold the red jungle fowl, Gallus gallus. These guys are endemic all across Southeast Asia, and these are the ancestors of modern chickens, aka Gallus gallus domesticus. And this guy is called an aurochs. They come from the Middle East, although they are now extinct. This is Bos primigenius, and it is the ancestor of the domestic cow, Bos taurus. And this kind of domestication, deliberately breeding things to select for certain traits, is something that humans are really good at. We've been doing it for the past 10 to 12,000 years with every plant and animal that we found useful. The most obvious example of this being dog breeds, which are all the same species of Canis lupus, the gray wolf, that we have manipulated into all sorts of horrible shapes. Or my favorite, the wild mustard plant, Brassica oleracea, which we have manipulated into cabbage, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower, again, just through selective breeding and bringing out different genes. And by the way, there is a word for this. It's called artificial selection. It's just human-driven evolution, and it's wild to think about. This is a great question. We all learned in middle school that there are males and females in biology. So why is it that so many biologists are now coming out and saying that sex isn't really a binary system? Well, in order to understand this, we need to understand what binary means and what sex means. Binary means that there are only and exactly two options. More than two or less than two is not a binary. A binary is only two. Now, what about sex? Well, there's actually a few ways that we discuss sex in biology, but the standard template way that we define it is by gamete size. If you have lots and lots of small gametes, we call them sperm and we call you a male. If you have very few large gametes, we call those eggs and we call you a female. But right away, you can see how this is a problem, because this would only apply to an isogametic species, species that have more than one size of gamete. There are isogametic species that only have one size of gamete, but still have distinct sexes. There are an isogametic species that have more than two sizes of gamete. There are monoecious species, which have two sizes of gamete, that every single individual produces, and so there are no distinct sexes. And every species has individuals that don't produce any gametes at all. They're completely infertile. So how are you going to classify them based based on something that they don't have. Remember, less than two and more than two isn't two. But let's forget about all that for a second, because usually when people are talking about biological sex, they're talking about sex chromosomes, or what I would call allosomes. And those come in either XX or XY, right? Well, no, that isn't the case in the vast majority of species, but whatever, it is in humans, right? Except those aren't the only options in humans either. You could have Klinefelter syndrome and have XXY. You could have Turner syndrome and have X and nothing else. And even if you want to just stick to the XXXY model, you could have a completely male body, but you have De La Chapelle syndrome, so you have XX allosomes. Or you could have a completely female body, but you have Sawyer syndrome, so you have XY allosomes. And yes, there are case studies of women with Sawyer syndrome getting pregnant and giving birth. Again, can't stress this enough, more than two options is not a binary. And I could go on and on about all the other ways we talk about sex and biology and how none of them are a binary either. But by this point, you should be asking the question, why do we use this system? Why do we have this model of classification that is so full of holes and problems? And the truth is that the concept of sex is a lot like the concept of species. See, there is no set definition for what a species is. There are like a dozen different ways to classify a species. Not a single one of them works all the time. But the concept of species helps us to organize and understand life. So we use this system even though it doesn't really mesh with reality 100% of the time. Because every good biologist knows that life is way more interesting interesting than what you could possibly write in a textbook. And biological sex works the same way. Nature does whatever it wants to do, and we come along and try to put things into boxes. And sometimes that just doesn't work, and that's fine. The simple facts remain that trans and intersex people still exist. More than two is not two, and sex is not a binary. This person makes three ridiculous claims in response to my video about sex not being binary. So let's go through all of them together. The first thing they say is that XX and XY fits 99% of the population. Let's pretend that that's true for a minute. Here's a real true fact for you. Over 99.9% .9 of all of the atoms in the entire universe are either hydrogen or helium. And yet, you'll notice that we don't disregard the other 116 elements in response to this apparent binary of atoms, because that is not how thinking works. So let's go ahead and just disregard that first point right away. The second thing that they say is that a transgender person raped several women in prison. 
Now, I'm sure that something hideous like that has happened, because rapists tend to rape people. But if you point to a horrible person and try to pick out any one characteristic from them, besides the fact that they are a horrible person, and then use that to imply that everybody else with that one characteristic might also be horrible people, you're going to end up with a lot of really stupid and hateful ideologies. So I'd recommend avoiding that line of not thinking in the future. And then finally, they say that we're going to see a lot of unfairness in gendered sports if sex is subjectively defined. Three things about that. Number one, it's weird that you care so much about sports that you're willing to sacrifice human rights and dignity to protect it. Number two, I never said that sex is subjectively defined. I said that it is necessarily poorly defined. And number three, I don't buy into your rhetoric here because trans people have been in the Olympics for almost 20 years now and nobody's had a problem with it until recently when it became fashionable to blend sexism and homophobia into the diarrhea martini called transphobia. So maybe find a better talking point there. Overall, this was just a swing and a swing and a swing and a miss there, bud. Try again next time. What's the weirdest looking extinct animal you've ever heard of? Lindsay made a critical error when she made this video public. Because that means that I would see it. And now this has to happen. Allow me to introduce you to Estamenosuchus, aka the crowned crocodile. But don't let the name fool you. As you can see by the skeleton here, this guy wasn't a crocodile. It was a therapsid. And fellow therapsid fans will know that that means that this dude lived during my favorite time period, the Permian, when all life was terrifying. Where are my Permian fans at? Arr. There are lots of great reconstructions of what this creature probably looked like. All of them are absolutely incredible. But in case you were wondering, don't worry. Yes they were big enough to kill you just by sitting on you. This figure here is 1.8 meters. That's about 5'10". So I'm 6'2". I would have come up just under the top of Estamenosuchus here. He was a big boy. And the most fun part is, we have no idea how dangerous they might have been, because it is still hotly debated amongst paleontologists whether they were carnivores or herbivores, because the teeth say one thing and the body size is another thing, and both of those are kind of thrown off during the Permian. Maybe they were omnivorous. Maybe it doesn't matter, because hippos are almost exclusively herbivorous, and they kill more people every year than lions and sharks and rhinos combined. But in the end, all you asked for was the weirdest looking animal, and Estamenosuchus delivers. He is the king of weird looking animals. Look, he's already got the crown. What you just saw was a spider sleeping. A behavioral ecologist named Daniela Rosler is getting pretty famous right now because she just caught several jumping spiders and put them in her windowsill and recorded them for a little while. And she saw that periodically throughout their sleep cycle, their little legs and spinnerets would start wiggling around and their retinal tubes would roll about in their heads. What she was observing was REM sleep. Now REM sleep in the animal kingdom is nothing new. We've seen countless different animals that do it, but this is the first evidence that spiders might have dreams. And that makes me so incredibly happy. I've never had the occasion to say this before, but I hope all the spiders are having good dreams out there today. What's the science fact that you 100% made up? Lots of people find puke to be funny, myself amongst them. And the reason for that isn't just schadenfreude. It's actually a misfiring of cranial nerve number 10, a.k.a. the vagus nerve. You see, the vagus nerve innervates all of your internal organs, both afferent and efferent, meaning it both receives and sends signals. And the same branch that controls your esophagus also controls your diaphragm. So when you see somebody swallowing or doing what we call peristalsis, the mirror neurons in your brain send a signal for you to emulate that behavior, and that's why we kind of feel like gulping when we're watching somebody eating. But it's the same thing for reverse peristalsis. When you watch somebody puking, your brain sends a signal to the same nerve pathway. And that's why a lot of people get sick when they see puke. But for lots and lots of people, that nerve fires backwards, and the diaphragm gets triggered instead of the esophagus, and your diaphragm starts wiggling, and your brain just runs with it, and it makes you laugh. Not a bit of that is true, but I do find puke funny. These are western conifer seed bugs. They look kind of like stink bugs that got stretched out, or like kissing bugs with pointy butts. They suck the sap out of young pine cones. That's pretty much all they do. And they're making more western conifer seed bugs here in this ash tree, which as you can hear, is absolutely packed to the brim with cicadas. 
which have been molting for the past week or so. Here's a shell, and there's a shell, there's another shell clinging to this leaf over here, and now they're just out here singing, calling out to other cicadas to come mate, and the tree itself just got done mating. You can see that it's done flowering, and now it's producing these fruits. These are called Samaras, these crazy cool winged seeds. Just a beautiful island of life. Everybody boning here in my backyard. You're among the swine. Hey there, welcome to Cursed Biology, the series where I ruin your life with the worst science lessons I know. This is the chrysalis of a monarch butterfly. And you see this little stalk right there that holds the chrysalis to the silk pad that attaches it to whatever it's suspended from? That is called a cremaster. And do you know what else is called cremaster? It's this muscle that wraps around the testes and raises or lowers them based on temperature. I always remember the word cremaster in anatomy class because it's the master of the creme. And now for the rest of your life, you won't be able to see butterflies without thinking about balls or vice versa. Don't forget to follow me elsewhere.